Hearing no objections, that is so ordered. Let me make a brief uh, opening statement. I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, less than two months ago, this subcommittee held a hearing on the financial condition of the Postal Service. And the news that time was less than, uh, the news at that time was less than encouraging. In fiscal year 2008, 2008 the Postal Service lost $2.8 billion as it confronted record drops in mail volume and demand for services. Since our last hearing, the Postal Service's financial picture has gone from bad to worse. Just halfway through this current fiscal year, the Postal Service has already experienced a loss of $2.3 billion, which is just shy of its total losses from last year. Despite plans to cut costs this year by $5.9 billion, which is ambitious, the Postal Service officials still anticipate losing a total of $6.4 billion by year's end, primarily due to the current economic recession and its negative impact on mail volume. Electronic diversion of the mail has also uh, contributed greatly to mail volume declines as well, with more and more folks paying bills online and using emails instead of sending letters. The contraction of economic activity, particularly in the housing and financial sectors, has resulted in a sizable reduction in the volume of standard mail and has even caused some of our nation's foremost newspapers and periodicals to move entirely to an online format. To help close the gap between costs and revenue, we all realize that the Postal Service will have to make some very, very difficult decisions. In order to improve the organization's financial condition with the reduction in mail volume, the Postal Service no longer needs much of its existing infrastructure and is therefore in the process of examining its network of facilities as well as other processing and delivery capacities. For instance, the Postal Service recently announced facility consolidations, district office closures, and realignment of letter carrier routes as part of an ongoing effort to reduce costs and achieve savings. I've asked this morning's witnesses to address the impact of these and other measures on employees and customers, and to discuss whether these actions go far enough, and also to explore additional options that the Postal Service has at its disposal to lower expenses, to increase productivity, and ultimately achieve some level of savings. <coughs> Today's hearing is intended to help us learn from our witnesses how many of these recent cuts employed by the Postal Service have impacted overall operations as well as customer service and the future viability of the Postal Service. The subcommittee is also interested in hearing from our witnesses any additional opportunities or ideas they may have to further reduce the Postal Service's overhead and costs. The news we are faced with at this hearing is dire, and these cuts alone may not be enough to help return the Postal Service to financial solvency. The Postmaster General has discussed the possibility of moving to a five-day mail delivery schedule. And we may be at a point where we need to cons seriously consider what that option would require by researching possible associated savings, making sure we have the right assessment as to what that move might involve. We also need to consider the service impacts by such a decision. And I understand that uh, many of the members of this committee and members of the public uh, do not believe that this is a decision that should be reached lightly. As we look toward the future after the possible enactment of some measure of financial relief for the Postal Service and beyond the current economic recession, the Postal Service finds itself having to evolve and realign its business model in order to meet the needs and services requirements of the 21st century service. As Postal Service officials continue to make difficult decisions to cut costs, there'll be, of course, consequences. It is the job of this subcommittee to ensure that these decisions are well thought out and designed. Since many of the good men and women at the Postal Service, as well as postal customers, are being asked to sacrifice in these tough economic times. I'm looking forward to a fru fruitful discussion on this timely topic. Once again, I want to thank all of our witnesses for their attendance and, and willingness to help this subcommittee with its work. And we look forward to your in, input this morning. I now want to 
extend uh, five minutes for an opening statement from our ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz, from Utah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for all for being here. Uh, we do appreciate your dedication and commitment and, uh, and taking time to, to be here. Uh, rather than read this opening statement, I'd ask unanimous consent to simply submit this, uh, my comments into the record, if that's okay with you, Mr. Chairman. With, without objection, so ordered. And again, thank you, and look forward to listening to your testimony and having some interaction with some questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Ms. Holmes Norton, the, the delegate from the District of Columbia, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, you have done um, the public uh, an important service by holding this hearing. Um, we don't want the post office to disintegrate before our very eyes. Uh, and this may happen. Uh, the last thing the Postal Service needed was even a mild recession. Uh, this is a structural event, and I believe we have to all wake up and realize it. Institutions will not be as they were when this recession is over. Some institutions will not exist. Um, I uh, doubt, uh, Mr. Chairman, you said uh, we have to look at whether or not uh, what the nip and tuck, and may I congratulate the committee for uh, the use of, of really <laughs> germane language, whether the nip and tuck, uh, fun language, of course, uh, but it does drive home what the Postal Service has been uh, forced into, and everybody is doing it. But not every institution was nearly experiencing the winds from all sides. This institution is, has been experiencing a hurricane, uh, and it's long been in this hurricane, uh, and much of it not of its own making. It has to do with huge changes in, in our uh, society. Um, but the, 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 the current uh, recession did occur, and once again, I think, calls into question the very business model that we have before us. Uh, the only analogy I can think of that is experiencing this kind of disintegration before our very eyes is our newspapers. Nobody thinks that they're going to survive in the, in the form uh, that they exist. Everybody knows they are essential. Imagine getting your news from blogs and the internet and, and, and kind of picking it all up and trying to put it together. They serve an important function. Well, they've got to find another way to do it uh, because the economy long before the recession was bidding them goodbye. No institution has had a deeper uh, um, um, uh, uh, long-term decline. No institution that I can think of has had a deeper long-term decline than, than the Postal Service. So, Mr. Chairman, I would like to hear from the Postal Service this, this morning something other than nips and tucks. I would like to know whether there is any uh, new thinking going on at the Postal Service. I, for example, I don't even think this is a huge uh, change, but it is a real change. I'm willing to look at something that I would not have, uh, have thought about when I first came to Congress, a five-day delivery. I don't think we can say to the Postal Service, hey, make sure you deliver the mail the way you did to my, in, in my and I'm a third-generation Washingtonian. Y'all have done a fine job. Uh, when my great-grandfather came to Washington, he walked off of a slave plantation in Virginia, and the Postal Service was doing just fine then. Uh, and it continued to do just fine for generations. What has happened to the Postal Service requires the po is not is not the fault of the Postal Service, but the Postal Service has got to find a new way to do the business of guaranteeing the delivery of mail, essential mail, to the people of uh, this country uh, and the world. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to thank you for holding these hearings. I uh, am going to have to go to a markup of the State Department uh, authorization legislation all day in the Foreign Affairs Committee. but. I thought this so important 
uh, I wanted to come uh, briefly for the beginning. I, the future of the post office is at stake. Uh, the future of how postal service is delivered to our constituents is at stake. And this Congress needs to, to be, listen carefully, uh, and we're going to have to work together on creative solutions. And I agree with Mrs. Norton that it may mean that the post office of our grandparents may not look like the post office uh, for our grandchildren uh, as we move out to the future. Uh, we have to create a business model for the post office that's viable as we look to changes in technology, we look to changes in the communication media, we look to changes in the, uh, in the marketplace. So uh, I'm going to be very interested in, in uh, getting a report on, um, on the testimony today. And again, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for taking so much time to be so thorough. Uh, we have three great panels today. Uh, and I know it's going to be very informative. I think if, if the public really understood what was at stake, uh, we'd have to have this hearing in the Cannon Caucus Room uh, because, uh, as Ms. Norton said, uh, the, the future is not going to look like the past with respect to postal services. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, just to explain the process here, uh, there are a number of hearings going on at the same time. Uh, I know that. Uh, Ms. Holmes Norton, Mr. Connolly, and our ranking member are all due in other hearings as well, so they will come in and out as others arrive as well. Uh, but that's just the nature of things. Uh, we do have a custom here in this committee it, to swear all witnesses before they provide testimony. So may I please ask you to rise and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to the subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, let the record indicate that all of the witnesses have signaled or answered in the affirmative. And uh, as always, your entire written statement it will be entered into the record. Uh, just as a matter of protocol, the green light on that little box before you uh, will indicate the beginning of a five minute uh, period to summarize your statement. Uh, it will turn yellow with about a minute to go, and then the red light indicates your time for statements has, has expired. And uh, I will do a brief introduction of the first panel uh, before we before we hear testimony. Gotcha. On our first panel, uh, Mr. William Galligan is the senior. Vice President for Operations for the United States Postal Service. He is responsible for the organization's engineering, facilities, delivery, network operations management, and post office operations. Earlier in his career, Mr. Galligan served as Vice President of the Retail and Delivery Operations and oversaw the retail and delivery function of the nation's post offices. Mr. John Waller is Director of the Office of Counter Accountability and Compliance at the Postal Regulatory Commission. Mr. Waller leads the Commission's analysis of Postal Service price proposals and oversees technical support for studies, including measurement of the Postal Service's performance and impact assessments of major Postal Service network reorganizations. Mr. Philip Herr is the Director of the Physical Infrastructure Team at the Government Accountability Office. Since joining GAO in 1989, Mr. Herr has managed reviews of a broad range of domestic and international concerns. His current portfolio focuses on programs at the Postal Service and the Department of Transportation. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Galligan, you may begin with uh, an opening five-minute statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Chaffetz, and members of the subcommittee. As you know, the Postal Service is experiencing one of the most severe economic challenges in its 234-year history. Due primarily to the downturn in the economy, we have seen mail volume fall by 32 billion pieces, or 15 percent, since 2007. That represents a revenue decline of $12 billion. At the same time, we have experienced a continuing expansion of our delivery network which will have grown to serve 2 million new addresses by the end of 2009. Our projections call for a loss of $6.5 billion this fiscal year, with a likely cash shortfall of $1.5 billion. And we do not expect any improvement next year. As the total mail volume falls, we are also experiencing a long-term shift in mail use patterns. Over the last decade, mailers have been reducing their use of higher revenue first-class mail, 
and as more mail has entered closer to its delivery point, the demand for end-to-end -end service has decreased. The combination of these factors have a profound effect on our business model. In 2000, we have delivered an average of 5.9 pieces of mail to every address. Today, that has fallen to 4.7 pieces, a decline of 20%. Revenue per delivery obviously tracks this trend. We have been extremely focused on narrowing the gap by cutting costs without affecting service. And at the midpoint of our fiscal year, we are on track to achieve our goal of eliminating $5.9 billion in base costs. However, we face limits on our ability to reduce some costs. The enactment of the 2006 postal law requires us to pre-fund retiree health benefits, increasing our annual costs by more than $5 billion. Only new legislation can reduce this obligation, which is unsustainable in today's economy. That is why we strongly support the passage of H.R. 22, which would result in annual savings of about $2 billion. But the fact remains that all of these steps would be insufficient to return us to solvency. They will not fully close our budget gap of $12 billion. We are experiencing a long-term economic problem that requires a structural solution. Over the past several years, we have taken significant steps in this direction, streamlining our network to accommodate changing needs and new technology, consistent with the expectations of the law. Throughout each of these efforts, service has continued to improve, reaching today's high level of performance. We have closed 58 airport mail centers and 50 remote encoding centers. We have begun an initiative to transform our 21 bulk mail centers into more efficient network distribution centers. While we have made some progress in consolidating operations to reduce excess capacity at our central mail processing plants, this has generally been met by strong local resistance, one of the chief barriers we face in the critical right sizing of our network. Your understanding and support of our efforts would help to reduce these barriers. We are also ex examining the operational needs at many retail and delivery facilities. Delivery volumes continue to decline, sales and revenue are down, and almost 30% of our retail transactions have moved from our lobbies to our website or to alternate access locations. There is the potential for substantial savings through consolidation at some of our over 3,100 stations and branches in cities of all sizes. Beyond the actions we have taken and those we plan to take, there is a need to make additional hard choices and trade-offs to adjust to sharply declining mail volume so that we can finance universal service in the long term. In considering our options, everything should be on the table. With the diminished demand for mail services, today's network requirements are beyond our financial means. But the law does not permit us to change the frequency of mail delivery. Providing the Postal Service with the ability to reduce delivery from six days to five days is an appropriate response to the sobering reality of our fiscal challenges, and one we only consider reluctantly. We have engaged our customers on this issue. Because this change would have an effect on service, it is important to understand the needs as we analyze operating in a different delivery environment. Looking ahead, the Postal Service will continue to implement the cost reduction and efficiency programs I have highlighted while we stay focused on improving service. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I appreciate your interest in creating a stronger yet leaner Postal Service and look forward to working with you to achieve this goal. I would be pleased to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gallion. Mr. Waller, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Shavitz, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. The Postal Service, as we've heard, is in a precarious financial position due to historic declines in mail volume. In response, the Postal Service is committed. Mr. Waller, yes. may I ask you to please pull that microphone oh, a little yes. closer to you? There we go. Better? Thank you, sir. Much okay. better. Thank you. Uh, in response, the Postal Service is continuing to make unprecedented work hour reductions and systemic changes. Solvency is contingent on the Postal Service achieving nearly $6 billion in cost savings this year and utilizing its maximum $3 billion borrowing authority. Even then, the Postal Service is likely to run out of cash by year end unless it receives legislative relief that would amount to $2 billion this year. 
Now, the Postal Service is trying to find new revenue to offset its volume losses. For example, since the passage of the PAEA, this commission has approved 49 negotiated service agreements between the service and its customers aimed at increasing revenue. Also, the commission has recently received two postal proposals for innovative marketing efforts, one of which is commonly known as the summer sale. While the commission continues to encourage the agency to use the pricing flexibility granted under the PAEA, the Postal Service must rely on cost cutting and efficiency measures to deal with its current financial difficulties. To this end, the Postal Service has significant changes underway within its network. For example, as noted by uh, Mr. Galligan, it is adjusting its delivery networks. It is employing more ground transportation, less airlift. It is adjusting post hours and reducing the number of neighborhood collection boxes. It is once again consolidating processing facilities, and it has just begun making significant changes in how mail flows between its network of some 400 plants as part of the long-promised surface transportation and bulk mail center reorganization. At the same time, it is launching new technologies to expand automation for sorting flats to carrier delivery sequence and to revolutionize management of the mail stream from collection to delivery through the use of intelligent mail barcodes. As I testified last year before the subcommittee about Postal Service efforts to realign its mail processing network, the Commission is concerned about the lack of a comprehensive plan with specific performance targets and gold as required by the PAA. The Commission continues to push for the Postal Service to expand the specificity and overall vision of its plans. The Postal Service is dealing with considerable uncertainty while implementing significant changes. This places a premium on the need for timely reporting on finances and service performance. The Commission is committed to enhancing the quality and utility of such reports. The Commission is once again now receiving monthly financial statements for the Postal Service, from the Postal Service to provide quick uh, financial transparency. Also, the Commission expects to see a robust service measurement system come to fruition this year based on the Intelligent Mail Barcode, which will extend measurement to nearly 95% of the mail. For example, starting this fiscal year, the Commission is receiving for the first, the first ever quarterly reports on speed of delivery of pre-sorted first class and standard mail by district and area office. This will be an important element in tracking whether service is or is not impacted by the various changes that are being made. Even if all the cost cutting and modernization efforts are successful, the Postal Service states its need for reg legislative relief in two areas. First, it has requested an adjustment in the method of paying current retiree health benefit <coughs> premiums and has endorsed H.R. 22 as a means of accomplishing this. Now, to clarify my written statement, the Commission has not taken a formal position on H.R. 22, but Commission Chairman Blair did, in his March appearance before this subcommittee, state his support of relief on health benefit premiums. The Postal Service has also requested the removal of legislative restrictions on the frequency of mail delivery. In its study of universal postal service than the postal monopoly, the Commission found the net savings from switching to five-day delivery to be about $1.9 billion. But before implementing any such change in service, the PAA requires that the Postal Service obtain an advisory opinion from the Commission that would involve a public proceeding on any such proposal. This concludes my statement. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I'm willing to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Waller. Mr. Harry, you now have five minutes for an opening statement. Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Chaffetz, and members of the subcommittee. Mr. Hare, I'm not sure if your microphone is on. I've got a green. Is that? Could you move it a little closer to you? Okay. Is that is now? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm pleased to participate in this hearing on the Postal Service's operations and network. My statement addresses three topics. First, challenges to the Postal Service's financial viability given current economic conditions. Second, opportunities to right-size Postal Service retail and mail processing networks. And third, options and trade-offs to consider. First, I'd like to highlight the dramatic declines in the Postal Service's financial condition as noted earlier. 
Mail volumes projected declined 10 to 12 percent for fiscal year 2009, the largest annual decline since the Great Depression with serious implications. A potential net loss of over $6 billion if the service achieves an unprecedented $6 billion in cost savings. Borrowing $3 billion, which is projected to still leave a $1.5 billion cash shortfall. And fiscal year 2010 is also going to be very challenging, with a projected decline of an additional 10 billion mail pieces. We are closely monitoring the Postal Service's financial viability at GAO. Depending on how effectively the Postal Service removes costs and manages its cash flow, we may consider adding it to our high-risk list. Turning to opportunities to right-size the Postal Service's retail and mail processing networks. Network right-sizing is needed to reduce excess capacity, improve efficiency, and facilitate streamlining. There's a window of opportunity for postal workforce right-sizing through attrition rather than layoffs. About 160,000 postal employees are eligible for retirement this fiscal year, and nearly 130,000 employees are expected to become eligible to retire by fiscal year 2013. The Postal Service has made progress in expanding alternatives to its traditional retail network. Customers can now buy stamps at drugstores and supermarkets or over the Internet. Accordingly, the Postal Service can streamline its network of close to 37,000 post offices, branches, and stations, which has remained largely static despite expanding alternatives. There is wide variation in the number of postal retail facilities among comparable counties, and opportunities to reduce them are particularly evident in urban and suburban areas. In addition, there's a maintenance backlog for these facilities. Turning to processing capacity, the Postal Service has made some limited progress in streamlining its processing network. Three long-term trends have increased excess capacity. First, automated equipment enables faster and more efficient mail sorting. Second, single-piece, first-class mail volume has declined from about 60 billion pieces in fiscal year 1990 to a projected 35 billion pieces in fiscal year 2009, meaning there's less mail to move through the network. Third, destination entry of standard mail has increased from 26% in 1991 to 80% in 2008. The Postal Service understands that it has excess processing capacity and has initiated studies of area mail processing consolidations. The status of recent proposals is listed in Appendix 2 of my statement. In passing the Postal Reform Act in 2006, Congress strongly encouraged streamlining the processing network. We recognize that the Postal Service faces resistance because of concerns about the effects on service, employees, and local communities. Senior postal management will need to explain its plans, engage with its unions, management associations, and the mailing industry, as well as political leaders, and then demonstrate results. In turn, Stakeholders need to recognize that major change is urgently needed for the Postal Service to remain financially viable. Other options to address the Postal Service's financial uh, challenges involve trade-offs. Deferring payments for retiree health care benefits would increase unfunded retiree health benefit obligations. Reducing delivery frequency could further accelerate mail volume decline. Downgrading delivery standards could affect time-sensitive mail. Raising statutory debt limits could exacerbate the Postal Service's financial difficulties in the future. And providing direct appropriations would be contrary to the principle that the Postal Service be financially self-supporting. In closing, the Postal Service and its employees play an important role in the American economy. However, the environment in which it operates has changed dramatically, and so too must the service as it takes actions needed to be self-sustaining. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions you or members of the subcommittee have. Thank you. Thank you. I now yield myself uh, five minutes for, for questioning. Uh, admittedly, there have been some significant uh, cost reductions already with the closing of some of these uh, air uh, mail facilities and, and other jurisdictions, but let me ask. Uh, Mr. Galligan, the, the initial projection from the post office was that you were going to be able to save or reduce costs by about $5.9 billion in the, in the first year. Rather ambitious. Uh, as I understand, at least the, the numbers that I've been getting in, that you're about 40 percent there uh, towards that number, but what I'm concerned about is the effect of diminishing returns as we go forward. Are we still going to make the 
uh, the number, $5.9 billion. Are we going to be able to achieve those savings? And if you could, and I realize I only have five minutes, could you sort of itemize in, in broad uh, strokes where we're going to get these, uh, achieve these savings and what the impact of, uh, uh, of those savings will be on the customers and the employees? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I, I the $5.9 billion is predicated on our success in, in meeting the cost reduction levels that uh, we've set out uh, through the year, and we've had to adjust in, in terms of the negative uh, uh, revenue situation we've experienced. Mr. But, Galligan, could you just pull that okay. mic a little bit forward? Yeah. There you go. Thank you. And, and I think the, the major savings, as I'd like to recap, uh, we've had significant savings in our uh, mail processing plants, not so much in terms of the physical infrastructure, but in the workforce environment. We have uh, uh, attrited about 33,000 positions versus the same period last year, uh, which about um, 9,000 of those positions came through uh, employees opting to take an early out with our uh, voluntary um, authority from OPM. So that, that labor savings constitutes the, the principal uh, achievement of the levels you see year to date. As it relates to our mail processing environment, um, we have gone through with our existing facilities an extensive uh, compression exercise uh, opportunity to, uh, to react to the fact that ad mail has declined so precipitously. Um, just last quarter, for instance, our standard flat volume, catalog volume, dropped 29 percent versus the same period last year. So that mail historically has been worked on what we call tour two, our day shift. Because that volume is no longer there, we have compressed and changed work shifts so that our critical operating times are met. Outgoing mail completed by midnight, the destinating mail that reaches our delivery units is completed by 6, 7 a.m. So that compression of people has constituted significant savings. In the delivery arena, uh, two, uh, two uh, major initiatives. The NALC, our National Association of Letter Carriers, has been very supportive and proactive working with us on adjusting our work rules around route inspections and ha have really had a breakthrough earlier this year and a more recent breakthrough whereby we use passive data, we work with our local unions, and we actually are able to quickly adjust routes uh, due to this agreement. We have taken out over 2,500 routes uh, related to that agreement and, and starting up, and we see many thousands of additional routes ongoing as the volume has, has essentially vaporized. We will expand the street portion of routes and, and limit the office time. Uh, in our post offices, likewise, we, we have benefited from rescheduling and the, and the downsizing and, and capturing attrition. All the while, we have reduced overtime significantly in our uh, plants and post offices, and uh, some, some levels are down into the, the zero to one percent range. So those are the principal areas that, that we have uh, been able to achieve those savings. While I still have a minute left, uh, the, the, the idea about, well, the idea connected to HR 22, that we, we have some forbearance in terms of the contributions currently required for employee uh, for retiree uh, health benefits. What impact does if you're going to move 150,000 employees into retirement at the same time that you're reducing contributions to, well, actually, uh, yeah, you're reducing direct contributions and taking out of the trust fund. What does that do to the equation where you have a higher utilization rate by the, you know, you've got 150,000 people that used to be working, now they're going into the, and some of them at, uh, at, at a more urgent uh, uh, time frame than we had before. Uh, how, how does that work out for HR 22, that whole phenomenon? Well, the HR 22, the, the, the $2 billion relief is in effect a short-term cash crunch issue. and, and um, Absent the, absent the $2 billion relief this fiscal year, our CFO uh, basically, if everything is perfect on our cost reduction and volume doesn't slide any worse than the projections at this point, we would, uh, absent the HR 22 relief, we would run out of cash to the tune of $1.5 billion by the end of this fiscal year. So that's the need for the short-term immediate relief around cash. In terms of the longer aspects, Mr. Chairman, um, 
I think we would have to, I would have to go back to our, our finance folks and look at the actuarial tables because, you know, certainly a, uh, the pool of 150,000 eligible people is a good news story from our ability to adjust things like our network, our downsizing, our delivery frequency, and that would give us the chance to, to move in a, a more painless environment through an attrition model. Uh, but I, w I wouldn't hazard a guess on what okay. actuarial burdens that might place right. on, on the long-term That's fair funds. enough. No, thank you, Mr. Galligan. I now yield five minutes to the ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz from Utah, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, following up on the HR 22 question, Mr. Galligan, uh, what, what happens if it does pass? What happens if it doesn't pass? And we have to deal with both realities. Well, what are the plans to deal with well, both scenarios? I, I guess let's... Congressman, let's start at the, um, the it does not pass provision. Uh, based on our forecast, we would run out of cash, even borrowing three billion as our uh, as our uh, statutory uh, requirements are, are allowing for this year. Even borrowing three billion, we would come upon the last day of the fiscal year uh, 1.5 billion dollars short of paying our obligation uh, to the health benefits. There, there becomes a choice when you're at the brink of insolvency. Do you pay employees? Do you pay su suppliers? Or do you not pay this $5.4 billion or $5.5 billion uh, by law? And essentially, we, we break the law by not paying that. Uh, not a place and, we want to be at. When do we hit that, those, when do we uh, cross that threshold? September 30th, 2009, last day of our fiscal year. That's my understanding. If it were to pass, what, what kind of assurances can you give us that you'll continue to make the types of operational efficiencies uh, come to reality that, that – uh, and, and by the way, I, I got to tell you, I, I think that from my personal vantage point, I think the Postal Service has done uh, a quite remarkable and dramatic job of cutting costs along the way. I, I think in, in many words, you, you should be commended and, and uh, pat on the back. There, there's certainly criticism along the way. But the, the progress that has been made, and, and hats off to Postmaster General Potter along, the, along with the, the staff and whatnot, but what assurances can you give us that that, that, that type of commitment to efficiency would uh, continue to propel above and beyond what's, you know, what would happen with H.R. 22 well, should it pass? I think this fiscal year in this cash situation, I, I do see some risks. I mean, we are projecting the ability to cost cut $5.9 we're on track to do that, but there are presumptions in that uh, based on the cost of energy. What's your for biggest instance. worry? Well, my biggest worry right now is the gas pumps in the last couple of weeks have, have ratcheted up, and we know it, I believe it costs us about $9 million a year per, per penny of increase. So, you know, uh, our ability to cost cut and the calculations on that saving include some presumptions on how fuel is, is uh, uh, how fuel prices will run for the remainder of the year. And uh, we have some significant savings that we believe are occurring based on the same period last year. But if fuel, uh, gas prices cause us a problem, that could put a little imbalance there. If, if volume falls greater than the 180 billion piece level we forecasted, that puts more pressure on that, that break even. even. Even with the $2 billion, essentially, if we miss those cost cuts and or revenue falls below the 180 billion piece volume level and we have not seen you know any light at the end of the tunnel on volume turnarounds if those two elements um, miss target we're, we're still at that cash position at september 30th. And, and let me ask you the last question mr chairman here i have just a moment uh mr galley it, it, it's one thing to just keep continue to cut costs but what are you doing to actually market and and, and grow the services and expand the market share and, and actually market the Postal Service as a viable alternative to some of the competitors that, that may be out there. What, what are we doing proactively to make the post office uh, more useful and more relevant in people's lives? Right. Postmaster General Potter has uh, restructured our, our marketing organization to a products group. We have a, a president of products, um, and he is working on all opportunities of where we can grow and rebound. And I think if you step back and look at the mega trend, as was highlighted in, in the opening comments, there is a mega trend in first class mail away from mail correspondence and mail transactions. That has moved and will continue to move to electronic diversion. 
the first class co co correspondence to email. Yeah, and, I, I, and, and I know the challenge, but yeah. we need a little bit more than Homer Simpson to get us out of the challenges yeah, we're facing. I, I, so yeah, I, Homer's not the cure, obviously. Yeah, exactly. But, so. but, but th there are some positive things. We believe going forward the future in mail is a rebound in advertising dollars. One, one of the curious things is, is we have actually seen a glimmer of hope that despite the fact that ad dollar spend has declined probably 30% nationally, uh, we have actually grown our share of the pie, but a dramatically reduced pie, essentially. So we, we, see, our, we see some percentage growth to about 22% of ad dollars. So our product people are going after ad mail in a big way. We're, we're out of time here. Okay. Let me just say, Mr. Chairman, that I, I, uh, I appreciate that. I, I would personally love to see and would challenge and hope that we would get much more creative. And I'd love to see and, and, and uh, be engaged in what type of ideas, big ideas, that we can have to, to move us in the right direction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Galligan, just on a uh, follow-up on the, uh, the gas price, do we not make long-term uh, fuel contracts on behalf of the Postal Service? And that, that's one, one just on this uh, fuel issue. And is the post office, in absence of any of those long-term contracts, are we impacted by the state increases that are being considered uh, on, on the gas tax? Yes, Mr. Chairman. The, um, we, we are impacted at the state level because much of our, our uh, fuel purchases are from local um, fueling stations. So there, there are implications around um, the, the total cost of, of gasoline. We strategically have not in the past, and we have shied away from it, we have not um, gone into options around uh, fuel. I know some airlines have done that strategically very well for years. We have not gone out there uh, in, in futures and, and purchased co long-term contracts to, to, to basically hedge on that. Uh, so we, we, we pay as we go, essentially. Okay, thank you. Our chair recognizes Ms. Holmes Norton for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what, 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 what I'm trying to do is see if we, uh, as the title of the hearing uh, implies, whether or not savings can make a difference in, in terms of saving the institution. We just had, Mr. Waller, is it, Mr. Galligan, an increase in the price of a first class stamp. Isn't that true? Um, can we look forward to annual increases in the price of stamp for first class mail and what effect has that had or is that expected to have? Uh, yes, Congressman. We have, under the new law, uh, the ability to link annual price increases, smaller incremental uh, price increases on our, our uh, mailing products. And you anticipate that the increase in revenue will offset or be more than the loss in business? Absolutely not in this case. We, the projection coming off of this recent price increase is that it will bring us over $600 million of, of new revenue from now to the end of the fiscal year. And in an annualized, the full cycle, it is worth about $1.5 billion. Uh, the increase is worth? The increase that just went in, right. But you, you, you believe that, it, so it, 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 it contributes then, or it's a desperation move that, that you're going to have to, how, 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 is this the first time you've been able to engage in annual increases? No, it is not. This is actually uh, from the law in 2006. We had one adjustment under the old rate regime in 2007, 2008, and 2009 have been the first, and, and they are linked Seven, essentially. Seven, eight, and nine. Uh, eight, eight, and nine are actually under the new law, and they are linked. They are essentially capped at the CPI level under the law. So we will raise rates at the CPI level annually. That's just the rate. But do you, do you anticipate that, that given the, 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 the problems you're having, that these annual rates are going to continue? Well, the annual rate is allowed to continue at the CPI level. If CPI, for instance, uh, through the next uh, number of months is almost at zero, that means we would not be able to file a, any, any kind of price increase next May. Um, you, you testified, Mr. Mr. Gallagher, that there was a, 
15 uh, percent uh, decline. I'd like you to compare that with prior years. We're looking here at a, at a very unusual right. period. Right. What's been the, how does that compare with the fall off uh, and the deficits in the post Actually, if we, if we look back last year, I believe we were down about 4 percent to the previous year. 2007, we were almost on same period last year. As a matter of fact, in early 2007, we were still seeing some, some very positive growth in the package business and in the ad mail business. First class so, has been on a 5 percent erosion. So we've gone from 4 years. or 5 percent to 15 percent in right. this single period in that we're looking at. Um, again, that we hope that this is a very irregular period, but it does give some indication uh, in, by comparison with what you're going through now, what, have you engaged in any layoffs or have you been able to do all of your downsizing and personnel by early retirements, reassignments and the like? Do you anticipate that there will be a need for layoffs in the future? Well, in terms of layoffs, we have not resorted to layoffs in terms of any of our network changes or, or consolidation efforts. They've all been done through attrition and employee repositioning, uh, supplemental workforce, temporary employees. Are you hiring people or? No, we, we, no, Congresswoman, we've been in a, a pretty hard freeze for some period of time. With the exception of certain skills, we need what are called electronic technicians, high-tech jobs to uh, maintain our equipment. We, we've, we've done some hiring and, and specialized skills just to keep keep the basic uh, So you have an aging work. workforce, essentially. Right, right. very much. Uh, if if uh, somehow, and obviously there would be lots of howls up here, because not everyone is sitting on this subcommittee and hearing what the, sub, what the Postal Service is going through, but if, uh, if you reduce to a five-day uh, delivery schedule, um, another, would that be another nip and tuck, or would that have a, uh, a, a structural effect uh, that on, your, on your decline? You know, I, that is, uh, that was a question that Chairman Davis asked me last time I testified in 2007. And at that point in time, volume was very, very strong and stable. Um, the, the, I'd have to say, quite honestly, it goes a little beyond the nip and tuck because it is Congress authority to decide what our universal no, I'm service talking obligation about the, I'm is. I'm talking about the effect on your revenue, on your business. I, I mean, it is, it, is, it is very serious, we understand, because, mm -hmm. because it, is a, it is a huge change um, from what people expect. I'm not sure it is as large a change from what people expect, given the plethora of ways we get information today, but it is a change. But I want to know the effect it would have uh, on your business if, in fact, you had to deliver fewer uh, 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 you, you've, you've testified, for example, you're delivering many more households, um, even, even, even though you uh, are experiencing this decline. And that's been the case before. The number of households grows. Uh, and therefore, you've got your six-day right. uh, delivery on even more households. If it was reduced to a five-day delivery, what would be the um, dollar effect what would be the savings effect of that kind of change? Okay, I, w w this, this is on the table for discussion because we believe it is the one multi-billion dollar annual savings opportunity that-, that It's a what, say. sir? Multi-billion dollar. But you don't know how much? Uh, I, we have ranges internally around, with, without loss of revenue, approximately 3.5 billion, depending per annually? year- Annually? Annually. Based on the scope, I think it, it could go as high as $4 billion savings. Now, what needs to be estimated is what negative impact that might have on top line revenue. Uh, and the PRC has made some, some have, have, has done some analysis on that. We currently have a cross-functional team working on all the aspects and kind of all the moving parts if we went to a five-day operating model. And we'll have probably, uh, a plan within the next three to four weeks to scope out all the the costs, but but they're, they're interchangeable. I mean, we we essentially have have looked at this uh, this future model in the respect that we would still want to maintain Saturday uh, service at retail. 
we would still maintain P.O. box service. You would service still maintain it at retail? At retail. Because? Because the American public depends on the Saturday morning visit to the post because office many of them pick are, up packages. are able to come, to, come only right, on, right, on, sa right. on that, Saturday. That is a high traffic point. So we would want to maintain that. We would maintain um, uh, seven-day-a-week service for remittance volumes moving into the banking system because we know what that means to their, their cash float. Uh, we, we would have to make those considerations. We would maintain, if someone purchases P.O. box service, we would maintain that six days a week. And I, and I think the, the P.O. box service goes to the fundamental, at least operational structure problem. Because what we have is we have sharply falling demand by the senders of mail. That's the $12 billion fall. At the same point in time, the recipient demand is fixed essentially based on Congress authority, universal service. And that recipient demand is not paid for. And I would venture to guess the American public would not want to pay for that through, through appropriations or a delivery fee of any sort. So I, I think your, your policy debate around that value of, of multi-billion dollar savings and impact really cuts to that big piece. We have cost reduction efforts in the hundreds of millions around network right sizing and station branch closing, but the one big ticket structural operational change relates to that Saturday delivery frequency, and who pays? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Bilbray, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, for the record, uh, want to state uh, I have a family member who is part of the Commission. I have not uh, had extensive discussion with him, just uh, casual uh, holiday conversation about the challenges that the Postal Service makes. So I just want to clarify that. I guess there's not too many of us to spell our name this way, so it's a dead giveaway. I, um, and Mr. Chairman, let me just say to the panel members, <coughs> you know, if, for 30 years I've been in government one way or the other. I was a 27-year-old mayor facing Proposition 13 and saw some real tough decisions having to be made down to the uh, abolition of the police department, which you talk about taking some heat, you try that. Um, but boy, I'll tell you, I wouldn't want to be in your, your seat no matter what. Uh, postal service is facing um, one of the toughest challenges I've seen anybody in government service ever have to face. Um, and uh, I'd just like to say that I really f feel that you guys are going, going to have to be given the benefit of the doubt for a whole lot of things. And um, I think the challenge here is that we have a constitutional obligation. I'm not so sure that ch constitutional obligation requires that um, it be a government employee who delivers mail. But it does require that we provide some kind of service. Uh, a good example, Mr. Chairman, that we don't talk about is that the same section that requires we hold a postal system also requires we maintain postal roads. And we don't physically, the postal system, the federal government doesn't physically own those roads, but we make sure the service is there. And I think that that's one of those things we got to be open-minded about. The gas tax issue, you know, uh, those of us in local government uh, don't have to pay it, but it's a year retention of your assets before you're reimbursed um, for gas taxes. I, I don't believe we are reimbursed. You're not reimbursed? No. Well, I'll tell you, first of all, Mr. Chairman, that one really sticks out, because why would we have our military have local government um, exempt and all the ones now the postal system ends up looking like the deep pockets? So I think that's one of those things that we need to seriously look at. The other thing I'd ask us to just be aware of is um, the, uh, the ethanol mandate, the 10 percent by volume, uh, constitutes a $6 a gallon uh, impact on the consumer. It's just something that maybe we, we can raise through this committee that um, when you look at the postal system, this is not just something that affects other people. It's affecting us and our obligations under the Constitution. Um, when you get around to hopefully someday being able to hire on new hirees, are you looking at a split role? Congressman, uh, could you explain that split, split role? Split role basically is that you have a whole separate package and uh, compensation uh, package okay. for new hirees. Okay. So you basically um, um, separate the, the traditional employee from the new employee. So yeah. you, you, you are entering into a different contract 
with mm -hmm. new hirees as of a certain day than the one you you right. committed to with the old. Okay, we, we kind of refer to that as a two-tier two -tier. structure, and essentially that is part of our collective bargaining agreement. We're, we're a year and a half away from, from that point with our unions, but uh, certainly our labor relations folks and, and human resource folks who, who deal with that could could consider that Yeah, possible. it's funny, on my notes, that's exactly, I have split row, two tier, it's this right. okay. argument go, goes around. You know, we're really at a situation where it's sort of interesting that the, um, the advertisement seg segment of the service was really an addendum um, that took advantage of the opportunity that we were delivering letters six days a, a week to the public and that why not have them carry advertisement at the same time. That whole world's kind of turned topsy-turvy, right? Right. So now uh, the primary obligation and responsibility has almost evaporated um, because of government action at working with the private sector at creating alternatives. <coughs> and now we're, we're looking at um, maintaining the status. Uh, do you really think there's some way, um, a practical way within the next couple of years to maintain six-day delivery? Personally, Congressman, I, I, as I said in my written testimony, I believe the six-day frequency, which is essentially the Saturday delivery day, it's not a question of if but when. Uh, there is just simply not enough demand for mail and the revenue of the sender to pay for that in our system. And I don't believe, if you look at how it's paid and ask all stakeholders, I, I don't believe the mailing industry would be willing to take a double-digit price increase to preserve it. I don't believe our unions would take a double-digit wage concession reduction to the payroll to preserve it. And I think in terms of your seat on this committee, I think you represent the American public, and I don't think the American public would want to pay out of their tax dollars a direct appropriation to preserve that. So what you're saying, uh, the, the complications that the f going to the five will create things like the fact that our relief carriers now are not going to have that niche right. market to be able to go right. in there. Um, we're be basically better plan on how to address the problems created going to a five-day delivery rather than trying to stave off the inevitable down the line. Yeah, and, and, and I would just like to point out that I believe the point in time from a, a, a a labor relations position is probably at no better time than right now. And the reason I say that is contractually with our NALC, we have temporary employees to the tune of 14,500. We still have some overtime levels uh, that are uh, able to be reduced in the delivery world because of the frequency. And the other piece of that is we have about 50,000 part-time flexible schedule carriers that would have reduced hours until such time that attrition caught up in the carrier world and those hours could come back. Well, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I, all I got to say to the panels, the uh, only thing worse than having to be on the management side of this is being the men and women who are care actually um, working out there in the field and actually got into a profession with the assumption that what could be more secure than being, a, being in, you know, in the mail service. And history had proven this was the best, but one of the most secure points of employment possible. And sadly, history uh, has proven us wrong on this, and there's some real challenges out there. Appreciate well, it. I thank you, back. Congressman. I, I, I think we, we are the best middle class employer in the country, and we want to stay that way. My father came out of World War II and became a clerk in New Haven, Connecticut, and I came out of high school and became a carrier in New Haven, Connecticut. And, and that's where we sought our, our careers. And, we want to keep it that way. I thank the gentleman. Uh, in following with the disclosure of Mr. Bill Bray, I must also uh, disclose, as I have on multiple occasions, that I, I currently have about 17 members of my extended family who work for the United States Postal Service. Uh, a number of those are retired, God bless them, but uh, a number of those, uh, two of my sisters uh, currently uh, working for the post office, a uh, bunch of my cousins and my brother-in-law as a carrier. So. Uh, I, the, the upside of that, I've been hearing these uh, issues discussed at the dinner table for many, many years. Uh, on the downside, management has not been at the table. So, uh, <laughs> Is that an invitation, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> <laughs> until now, until now. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri for five Thank minutes. You, Mr. Mr. Clay. Chairman, and uh, I find it fascinating that you have so many members that depend on the U.S. Postal Service in your family. That's probably a good thing. 
Uh, let me start with Mr. Galligan. Uh, in your testimony, you allude to significant limits on your authority to develop new products. Uh, give us some examples of new products that would be created uh, if these limits were lifted. Well, I, I, Congressman, I'm, I'm the operations guy, so I, I get this secondhand from our product group. But, but, but I think the law has provided new opportunities. And, and as I was highlighting before, we are pu pursuing a summer sale at this point in time on ad mail. If we can get new ad dollars on new mail, we can do those things. I, I, uh, I think the, the fact that, and it's more of a governance issue, that our need to bring products to market do have to go through a regulatory commission. I mean, we are modeled somewhat as a regulated monopoly that we have a, a postal regulatory commission that really governs what we can do uh, in our retail space, for instance. What products can we put on our retail counter? So we do have to go through those kind of, of, uh, of processes to bring new products to market. But within the scope of the law, there's new opportunities. The, the sale issue will be an interesting one to see if we can drive new revenue, uh, add decisions to maybe move ad dollars, the scarce ad dollars from TV or radio or or newspapers into the mail and, and, and get some business here in the back end of the year where our fixed costs are high and our volumes very low. But it is, it is a, a process that's typically in the private sector you are not going through the, the rigors and, uh, that we would have to go through. Thank you um, for that answer. How many employees do you estimate will need to be terminated uh, due to an end to Saturday deliveries? And Congressman, that, that goes to my previous point. Uh, the fact that our collective bargaining uh, situation currently is set up with, a, with about 14,500 employees, temporary employees, these are not career employees, those would immediately be shed and we could quickly move to that if we're granted the authority. The overtime reductions and about 50,000 employees are what we call part-time flexibles. Their hours would be reduced and we could avoid layoffs completely with the carrier craft. I, I am concerned that if we move out in the future and hit this wall after our authority to use those 14,500 temporary employees is gone, after overtime is down to zero, we would then only be able to achieve savings in those out years with, with layoff. The uh, more than 1,400 supervisors and management positions are being eliminated to, to reduce costs. How does the USPS determine which employees will have their positions eliminated? What we did, Congressman, is, is obviously as we face this, this issue, it's, it's not all to be, uh, the burden is not all carried on our rank and file, our, our, our bargaining unit members. We went after, in a very aggressive way, white-collar jobs. We set targets at 15 percent reduction in white-collar jobs in our districts. We've consolidated six districts completely around the country to save X hundreds of positions. And in our plant environment, because interestingly enough, in our plants, since the year 2000, we have cut our workforce by one half. That's the amount of attrition with technology, volume declines, et cetera. In that same time, we needed to play catch up around how many supervisors are needed for that lesser workforce. I mentioned earlier that uh, our, our day shift environment, because there is limited ad mail, is not as uh, bare minimum. So what we did is we calculated what we call a 22 to 1 ratio on white collar jobs in our plants, and we reset our our base of managers on that calculation. Okay, thank you for that. Why, why hasn't the uh, Postal Service offered any incentives to employees for taking early retirement? And are you working with the unions to evaluate the types of incentives uh, that the Postal Service would consider? Now, that is probably going to be the easiest question I get this year when we are facing potentially a $1.5 billion cash position we, we do not have the liberties right now to make those kind of decisions to, to even consider and offer any sweeteners or incentives this fiscal year. So you just think they're going to walk away from their jobs? I well, mean, we, we, we actually have a projection based on our year to date in this pool of 150,000 people that by end of year we should be down 43,000 uh, management and craft positions nationally. That's, that's the track we're on projecting. And, and that is a sizable uh, 
a reduction in workforce, uh, even for an employer as huge as, as the Postal Service, it's significant. So those 43,000 will be voluntary. Right. Uh, through attrition and retirement. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Rather than do another round of, of questions, I, I do recognize that our questioning doesn't necessarily hit on all the pertinent points that you'd like to share with the committee. So at this point, uh, even though, Mr. Galligan, you've had plenty of exercise this morning, uh, I'm going to ask you if you have, uh, you know, five minutes where you'd like to inform the committee of any topics that we did not raise uh, or, or simply amplify a point that you might have uh, touched upon earlier in your, in your discussion, and then I will follow to Mr. Waller. So you have a little, you have five minutes to think about. Uh, I noticed, you know, there may have been questions to Mr. Galligan, uh, and, but Mr. Herr and, and Mr. Waller, I saw you writing, so you might have your own ideas about questions that were asked uh, to Mr. Galligan. So I'm going to give you each five minutes and uh, just to uh, further um, elucidate uh, certain points. Well, Mr. Mr. Gellerman, certainly the key points are our immediate cash crunch, the, the $2 billion relief from H.R. 22 we desperately need and, and support that, uh, that bill. Uh, from an operations, from my jurisdictional point of view, I think uh, understanding from Congress uh, around our need to pull back this infrastructure, whether it's a plant closing uh, uh, or consolidation, those, those are necessary necessary choices that we, we have to take because of the, the decline in demand for, for mail. In our station and branch environments, and I know from the last hearing you mentioned it, we need to closely look at where we have brick and mortar facilities within very few miles or even walking distance of each other to be able to, uh, to go and analyze and do the right thing for our, our urban customer base. Uh, they are well equipped to take uh, their services through alternate access, uh, website, USPS.com, uh, other avenues. Uh, we need Congress support and understanding on that. And f foremost is if there is one big lever that needs to be pulled, it is around the five-day service. It is around understanding what, what we would not do on Saturday, how that would change the service standards, and how much savings would come out of that effort with also some very reasonable estimates as to what that might do in terms of mail volume. And I think that that kind of summarizes uh, my views operationally. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Galling. Mr. Waller, you're now recognized with five minutes. In regard to uh, first the uh, questions, I think it was Mrs. Norton was asking about the estimated cost savings and what it would do to the uh, revenue or the volume uh, reduction maybe because people stop using the mail. The, <clears throat> the commission and its estimate of the $1.9 billion annual savings from going to five days did assume a reduction in volume. Uh, a minor one, 2%, given the, what we're seeing lately, maybe that's a little bit too small, but a 2% reduction at least uh, built in and the models can do what if analysis to do more. Uh, that accounted for about six hundred uh, billion dollars million dollars of the difference between the postal service's larger estimate because they didn't include that um, the uh, other uh, point I think that around the carrier issue that is very important is that mail processing is about the uh, cost there the labor costs at least vary with volume almost a hundred percent up and down it can be done that way and the postal service has been very remarkable in maintaining that the carriers on the other hand it's about fifty percent variable so that you as volume drops you can't automatically lose as much uh, mail by uh, just uh, being more efficient in your delivery uh, because you have that great fixed cost of going around the route every day, whether there is a lot of volume or a little volume. And that's why it makes it so attractive to do a reduction in a day of delivery, because you eliminate that fixed cost. The other issue that was raised uh, by committee members here is the finding new forms of revenue. Uh, the the uh, Act did, uh, the PAA did restrict the Postal Service to postal activities to related to handling mail, did not want them 
going into a lot of new initiatives not related to postal and the commission has had to go through all their related services and say are is it a postal or non-postal is it grandfathered etc but we've really been uh, working very hard the commissioners with the uh, postal service to make sure as they come up with new initiatives and and the new initiatives are like the summer sale or the uh, the new logistics uh, thing that was just approved to allow special uh, loading of uh, less than full trucks, uh, a new type of service, uh, and all these negotiated service agreements. One of the things that we do is turn it around very quickly. Do not make it a long, lengthy hearing uh, so that if they reach an agreement with a, a mailer for a particular uh, sales season, that the commission works to meet either 15 day, 30 day, whatever uh, is the legal requirement for notice, uh, and been very successful in that regard. So uh, in a sense, we welcome all the more they can have. We're, the commission is working very hard not to be a bottleneck on the approval of any new initiative. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I think that we would like to see, the commission would like to see uh, all sort of new revenue opportunities develop, but they are restricted by the law to postal activities. They can't go afield. Thank you. Mr. Hur, you now are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, I think reflecting on some of the discussion and questions today, I mean, we, we applaud the Postal Service's efforts to achieve cost savings through work hour reductions. I mean, that's needed and necessary given the volume reductions that the Postal Service is facing this year. Uh, but that said, that's not a shortcut for longer term restructuring the retail and processing networks. Uh, we've had discussion today about that excess capacity and where it exists. There are opportunities there. Uh, the Postal Service identified about, they mentioned today in their statement, about 3,000 uh, potential facilities there in some work we did uh, in for the Senate uh, that came out about a year and a half ago. We had a methodology that looked at how counties are served, and that methodology may be a useful one in looking at those kind of uh, opportunities that are there. Uh, I think also if efforts to increase efficiency. I, I believe that you know people say in this kind of operation, you can't just cut, they also have to look at ways to make things more efficient. And work we've been, we have underway for this subcommittee looking at delivery efficiency, work with the uh, letter carriers, there are opportunities there to make sure the routes are structured in the most efficient way possible. That's very important. There's also some new technology that's being rolled out with the flat sequencing. One of the things that will enable is getting people on the carriers on the street more, more time rather than in the office sorting mail. Those are things that will ultimately help the Postal Service achieve additional efficiencies and be able to deal with one, the reduced volume, but also reduce costs as well at the same time. So we would encourage those kind of efforts as well. And I, the last thing, uh, there was some mention today about an additional study that uh, is coming out in two to four weeks looking at the impact of five-day delivery, and that's something that we've called for in the last several hearings we've done this year. I think that's very important for transparency. I think uh, Ms. Norton mentioned the importance of uh, having an understanding of the costs and the benefits of something like that, and I applaud the Postal Service in taking those steps to help people understand both the mailing community and individuals what that would mean for them so they can plan for that kind of change should it become necessary. Mr. Uh, I, I just want to ask you about that last point you made about the study. The committee has, has been grappling with the the, there, there were two numbers out there as to what might be saved by this reduction to five-day delivery. Right. Uh, one was 1.9 uh, billion. The other was considerably higher. Uh, this this study, what did it reveal, or has it been well, concluded this is yet? The analysis, I believe, this is uh, what Mr. Galligan mentioned that the Postal Service has underway to look at what those costs and benefits right. are, and that that's okay. something we've been on the record as yeah. thinking mentioning is important. Well, that, you know, that number serves as the underpinnings of what decision will be made by the committee uh, if, if it's reached. And, and you know, that, that's a very important number, so we want to make sure we get that right. Uh, in conclusion, I want to thank you each for at attending here and, and helping the committee with its work. Uh, I'm sure uh, there are some members who wish to attend today, but they're in other hearings, so I'm going to allow them to submit questions to you in writing and, and allow those responses from you as well in writing. But uh, I want to thank you again and bid you good day.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gonna, the committee is going to recess for about three minutes till we get the next panel up, and then we'll resume. Thank you.